Sarah Kaisak, Last in Reviews, and I am here with Steve Taylor and Marshall Allman, correct? Correct. And as director and one of the actors from Blue Like Jazz, which I saw last night. Oh, nice. Very good film. Oh, good. Um, I think uh, uh, some people are going to be skeptical of it just because of the undertone. Um, it has some religious undertone, but I don't think it's super overt right. that it's going to turn a lot of people off. So I think it, it's good. I mean, I wanted to see it. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it was amusing. Um, Steve, can you talk a little bit about how you came about with this project? Yeah, I'd read the book like six years ago over Christmas. And um, it's the book is uh, really almost like a stream of consciousness kind of collection of essays and thoughts. And you don't necessarily put the book down and think, oh, I see this movie in my head. But uh, I just love the idea of this this kid who grows up in a real kind of fundamentalist uh, Southern Baptist upbringing in Houston and ends up at in Portland, you know, uh, yeah. uh, the place where young people go to retire, <laughs> and, um, uh, and is living, uh, in this case, in the real story, he's living in a, in a house with a bunch of other guys, but he's a few blocks away from Reed College. And Reed College is, uh, of course, a real place. It's where Steve Jobs went for like six months, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a small liberal arts college, but it's... Uh, it's, it's really smart kids and yeah. very intellectual and um, and 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 they're when they party they party in a very different way from like Penn State or something you know it's like yeah. it's like odd very costumes and you know State. lots of drugs and uh, but but it's such a different environment you know yeah. and so he ends up in a place where he just doesn't know how to function and yeah. uh, uh, and has to figure it out and I, I just thought wow, this would be great to, to put on film you know I'm, why, I, for some reason we haven't seen that story yeah. that's a very American story you know someone growing up in a really religious upbringing and then you know being lost at college not knowing how to function yeah um, what about your locations you shot in Portland correct did, yeah um, and did you actually use Reed College we did you know originally we were we were skeptical that they would let us shoot there but we were certain they wouldn't let us call it Reed College um, and we turned in the screenplay and it went through kind of a faculty review process and they came back and they said, okay. And I was like, okay, what, we can shoot there? And they said, no, you can call it Reed College. In fact, they gave us logos to use, you know, and uh, they were very, very generous. Yeah. So um, we, we also shot in Nashville, Tennessee. We couldn't afford to shoot in Oregon for the whole shoot, so we had another campus that, uh, near Vanderbilt that was real similar to Reed College and we intercut the two. But. Um, yeah, so it was a really good experience. Well, how do you think the students responded? Man, to I, I have no idea. We're doing a screening <laughs> at Reed College two days before the movie's opening. And, you know, I was a little nervous about last night, but I'm petrified about what the students are going to think. Yeah. I have no idea. So I, Bring I, lots I, of beer. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. They're very good. Free food. Free <laughs> self-medicating, so hopefully, you know, yeah. something will kick in. Um, Marshall, can you or can you tell us a little bit about the casting process for you? Uh, yeah, for me, I got an email from a friend that said, "Hey, I got these friends that wanted your contact information. Can can I send it to them?" And I, uh, you know, being the great multitasker that I am, I completely forgot to respond to the email and just kind of blew it off, like, "Oh yeah, whatever." And then two, a couple weeks later, I get another email from the same guy who's persistent in like all caps like hey man I really want to get your contact information for these guys is it okay so I said yes and got this email later that night uh, from Steve saying hey uh, we're doing Blue Like Jazz as and I had heard of the book from some friends and it was very highly recommended and I liked what I'd heard about it so it had a, a, a high reputation already uh, for me and uh, so we're turning into a movie would you read the script you're on the short list of actors that we're considering for the lead role would you read it and just let us know if you're even interested? Um, so I read it about 10 pages in. I was like, this is good. It's funny and uh, touching. And it's, it's actually uh, it looks like a real script. Yeah. So uh, I emailed him back and I said, hey, man, uh, I'm your guy. I'm a thousand percent in. Thanks for the offer. <laughs> and he emailed me back and he said, well, that, that wasn't really an offer. <laughs> He said, but I promise I won't offer it to anyone else before we meet. And so a week later, we sat down in L.A. to, uh, to go eat and, and to d discuss the movie. And sat down and handed me a mix CD that he yep. had made as like kind of a pseudo soundtrack for the movie and said, get the part. And I, uh, I instantly was, it was a lot easier for me to eat. <laughs> and uh, 
and then we just hit it off. We hit it off and had a blast. So yeah, we kind of bonded over music because yeah. that, that original soundtrack CD had uh, this band out of Portland, Menomina, which is one of my favorite bands, and Deer Hoof and Be Your Own Pet. And then you made a mixed CD that yeah. you sent to me, where he actually took the screenplay and and pulled out really interesting songs. Like there was that Vampire Weekend song you put in was was like. Campus. Yeah, yeah. just kind of told the story with music, and so we, we just hit it off over music. Yeah. What about the other two actresses that are in, in the film? Well, we had an L.A. casting director, and I had forgotten that Marshall had worked with Tanya Ramon on... Uh, Little Dizzle. Yeah, Little Dizzle. And um, it was one of those things, you know, the casting director was really good because they would see a lot of people, but they would only send me the, the people that they liked. And in this case, they just sent me a link to Tanya's uh, audition to play the role of Lauren, and it's, it's, it's like five seconds in, it's like, boom, that's her. It, yeah. You just knew. Mm -hmm. And Claire Holt, who plays Penny, was very much a similar thing. They had like three or four people, and, and she just shone. Uh, and when someone can do that, you know, in an environment like this with, with a blank wall, mm -hmm. and they're just sitting there, and they've got a script, yeah. when they can pull, up, pull that off, you know they got something special. Yeah, I remember seeing some of the tapes for the people that auditioned for Claire's part, and there were really good actresses, but then like Claire was obviously very good, but she also had like this, it was almost like she had a secret, you know, mm -hmm. long, and which is really necessary for the character of Penny. Yeah. And I remember being like, yes, that's the clear choice, because you, you felt like she had something that you couldn't quite get, you couldn't yeah. quite ascertain. There's actually a line in the movie, like there's just something about her that I don't really get, you know? Yeah. And so she had that. I remember that that was what got my vote. I was like, yeah, okay, that's right, yeah, 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 that's right. I sent it to you too. Yeah, and then Justin Wellborn who played the Pope was just oh, yeah. awesome. And yeah. honestly, I probably saw 100, 150 auditions, and it wasn't only that he was great, but there was nobody else who even came close. So it was either him or nobody because it's a it's a and tough so role. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. I remember reading the script and being like, good luck casting that one, buddy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, I, it's already been picked up, roadside. Yes. How was that process? I mean, how, when did this get picked up? Yes, it got. Uh, we finalized the deal like right before Christmas, okay. and I think we we did a screening in LA in uh, November, and uh, roadside was at the first screening, and the Howard Cohen, the co-president, came up to me after we said that was a really good movie, and it's like. Um, you know, they were kind of like my first and almost only choice just because they're so good at, at taking mm -hmm. smaller films yeah. and taking them to the widest possible audience. Steve has a complete love affair with Roadside. <laughs> I do. I remember asking him, I was like, Steve, are you sure it's Roadside? He's like, man, no doubt. He's like, look, man, I know this. I've been researching distribution company. These are the people. I was like, okay, man. And he's like, oh, they're awesome. And, and you know, he's, he was really enthusiastic when they had an equal... It was a very mutual relationship, so yeah. that was really exciting. Yeah. You're one of the many projects here who have relied on Kickstarter to get somewhere. Yeah. Um, when did you initially post Kickstarter? Well, I have to start by saying it was not my idea. Okay. We uh, spent four years trying to raise money for this movie, and I never have had a project that I thought was so obvious and was going to be so easy and was so impossible to raise money for. And we finally got to the place after four years where Marshall had to go back to work on True Blood the day after Thanksgiving. So we had a very small window where we had to get the movie shot. We had an investor in Seattle who had been in from the beginning. Somebody else came in from LA. We had just enough money to get the movie in the can. And then the night before we opened our production office, the LA guy dropped out. And so we were screwed. And I, I called up Don Miller, the author of Blue Light Jazz, who had been a part of this from the beginning. I said, you're not gonna believe it. And he was so bummed out. He blogged about it the next day and just said, sorry, We've worked on it for four years. We can't get the money. The movie's not going to happen. We yeah. apologize. We did our best. It's it's over. And then all these people started writing and saying, "You got to make this movie. It's important. You know, I, I can give you twenty five bucks, or I'll get my friends together and we'll give you a hundred bucks." And two guys in their late twenties in Franklin, Tennessee, sent us a video. They said, "We don't have any money, but there's this website called Kickstarter.com. Let's start a Save Blue Light Jazz campaign on Kickstarter, and we'll get you the money you need." And you know, Kickstarter was fairly new at that point. Yeah. And I, I researched it, and I loved the site, but it's like the most any movie had raised at that point is like 40, 50,000 bucks, and we needed a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I just told the guys, I just don't think it's going to happen. And I said, Do you have any better ideas? And I didn't. So they launched a campaign six days later, and in 30 days, 4,500 people gave us $345,000. It was like a, a Kickstarter record, yeah. and that's why we got to make it. 
Yeah. I love the credits at the end. With the, it was slow <laughs> yeah. on that side. Associate producers. Right. Mm. <laughs> I know. Well, we promised everybody who gave us, like, I think it was 100 bucks, we'll send you a t-shirt and we'll put your name as an associate producer in the credits. And we won't wait until the end. We'll put you on the right side while the other credits are going. But we never imagined we'd have, like, I think it's like 1,800 associate no, producers. No, it's more than that, it was right? more than that. It was a lot. So we had to, to pull it all off. We had to make for a very yeah. long credit roll and speed those up. Yeah. And what, I didn't did think you say they get nine seconds? Is their I name think they're, on, they're on for eight seconds, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was going to happen, so I even said, uh, give us 10 bucks and I'll call you and thank you personally. And I ended up with 3,500 calls to make or, that I finished off of about two months ago. But, uh, <laughs> so I feel like I know our, our backers very, very well. Very yeah, my, my family really got into the campaign. <laughs> and so throughout, throughout, you know, this whole process, they'd call me and be like, hey, I got a call from Steve Taylor. <laughs> Your director called me. <laughs> I told him I'm, we was related. <laughs> No, my family is not that southern. Really? I'm kidding. I'm oh, kidding. <laughs> I got deep south family. I'm an Austinite, you know. Uh, oh man, I get him. I was all. Oh, that's so funny because I would I, every once in a while someone would say, "Oh yeah, he's my nephew. Mark yeah. is my nephew. Yeah, yeah." So, I talked to your dad yeah. and your mom separate times. It's like there was a lot of a lot of. Love. I'm keen to him. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> They do sound like that here, though. <laughs> That's right. We're in some places. Yeah. That's true. Some places. Um, so, what are your what are your hopes for? What kind of message do you hope to bring to the audience with this film? Well, the re original reason I, I love the book, but there was this scene that that happens uh, at Reed College during the final Ren Fair party that mm -hmm. they build a confession booth and essentially, you know, they confess the sins of of Christianity. Yeah. Of course, we all know they're out there, but. Um, uh, what I loved is that it was someone from the inside saying, yeah, I know we, how badly we've screwed up, but I'm sorry for it. Mm. And, uh, or that how far, far I've fallen short right. of even rep pretending or even trying to represent God. That's right. Yeah. So it was, it was personal and it was kind of corporate at the same time. And I just thought, that I want to see that scene in a film, you know? Yeah. I think one of the understandable criticisms that gets leveled at Christianity is because, you know, there's, there's so much hypocrisy in our midst, but I think that people on the outside don't realize that, oh yeah, we actually know that. We, you know, we are aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, the confession scene kind of showed, a, you know, it was a certain self-awareness and a humility that doesn't often get portrayed. So I, I just love that scene. Now I haven't read the book that this is based on. Um, is there a lot of humor in, in the book? There yeah. is, yeah. And Don can't say anything without being funny. He's, <laughs> okay. like, he's like, oh man, he's so funny. He yeah. cracks me up all the time. Yeah. So that was part of the blast. And from the beginning, it's like, we want this to be a comedy first, you know? Mm -hmm. There's some dramatic elements, but we want to make sure. What's amazing about Don, too, is as good as an author that he is, he's almost, I'd say, you know, just as good as a public speaker. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he's it's really like, good. I'm a, he's like a, he's practically a stand-up comedian up yeah, there. You yeah, know? he's good. So. Yeah. We had a blast. Usually, you don't want the author anywhere near the writing room when you're making a screenplay. But uh, he was a, a huge asset and a real integral part of uh, turning the book into a screenplay. Was he? Did he come to set or offer any suggestions? He was on he... set from the beginning, and um, uh, and then I think he had some speaking engagements. He had to leave about three weeks through, but uh, it, it was it was great fun. I, I don't I don't know if he had as much fun as I did having him around, but because uh, it's it's always awkward for you know a writer to be on set. But he was, he was just, he, I think he, he's great. He was great to have around. And he was, he played Louis Dagg. Oh, that's right. He played in the movie. The, uh, oh, okay. He played the, that's him playing the trendy writer. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a character named Trendy Writer in the book, you know, yeah. which, which is, uh, you know, not a very likable character. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Uh, he's supposed to be reading kind of this, like, really, what would yeah, you say? Yeah, kind of self-absorbed. Self Where the robots come from. Yeah, yeah. The robots, oh, okay. Right. Yeah. And, and so. You know. Yeah, didn't Don read from one of his own books? One of his earliest books, Just yeah. so self-deprecating to put himself in the role. It's like so great, you know? Yeah, yeah. That was fun. That's Don's fun. so meta. That's right. <laughs> I don't know. You probably don't know this, but we actually, he actually, his latest book is also a New York Times bestseller okay. called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years, and it's about us writing the screenplay, which, you oh, know, wow. you can't get much more meta than that. Yeah. But, um... Uh, and for a while, it looked like that was all we were going to get out of this because the movie wasn't uh, getting funded. Only way you could get more meta reading that book would be to sit between two mirrors. <laughs> That's right. And every now and again, look into the infinitum. Right, right. <laughs> Can you speak about um, next projects for both of you? 
Uh, yeah, I've got uh, I've got a film coming out with uh, as Billy Bob Thornton's uh, directorial. Okay. Uh, I guess what do you call it? He, you know, resurgence or whatever. He's uh, directed a movie called uh, Jane Mansfield's Car. Okay, I saw it. that on an IMDb, and I was like, that's an odd title. Yeah, <laughs> odd title, amazing cast. Okay. You know, my uh, it's like Robert Duvall, Robert Duvall, John Hurt, Kevin Bacon, oh, uh, wow. Billy Bob. Uh, it's an amazing cast. Ray Stevenson. I uh, got that, and I'm going to be on Justified, a show okay. on uh, FX. Yeah. going to be on that in, uh, this week, I think. Oh, wow. This week oh, wow. and next week, yeah. Yeah, or in seven days at least. And then, um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you never know, you know, what I got. Got some things in the, I, I have other things yeah, that I could say, but obviously. they're not completely finalized yet. You're yeah, right. I, I'm just taking a, a really long vacation once this movie comes out and figure out what's next. But I, I would love to, Don and our other co-writer and myself are working on a new idea, so if there's a way we can pull that off, we hope to do it because it's so much fun hanging out in a room with yeah. those guys. One of the running gags for this whole experience of making them in the last five years, basically, mm -hmm. was Steve, is he's like doing the work of like seven people, you know? And uh, I mean, Steve at this point is so exhausted that <laughs> he would tease him because he'll he'll fall asleep like standing up like make conversation and just be like <laughs> I'm just so glad I stayed awake during this interview <laughs> <laughs> uh, made a good mo moment though yeah, that's yeah. right honestly last night I fell asleep twice watching the movie <laughs> <laughs> there were short periods but I realized oh, and man, I mean I, I guess I guess I, just ha I have to reiterate that you really are doing the job of seven people so <laughs> Well, thank you so much, guys. Thanks. And Pleasure, then once Sarah. again, uh, Plute Like Jazz comes out next month. That's right. Yeah. April 13th. April 13th. Friday April the 13th. 13th. <laughs> April 13th. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. This is really nice. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so Appreciate much. It.